The purpose of this video is to give you a case study into an Australian film to support your work on your group discussion task. What our aims will be will be to give you some insights to help you with the group discussion and to review your understandings of visual conventions through this case study. Um, one of the assumptions we'll be making is that you've done year 10 and there's a, a fair amount of learning you did there that you need to bring to bear in uh, this particular unit. Specifically, I'm talking about film studies and things like that that you have done in the past. And so our case study will be on the 1981 film Gallipoli, directed by Peter Weir, one of Australia's great directors. It stars Mark Lee, who you probably don't know, but it also stars Mel Gibson in one of his early films before he had his meltdown. The screenplay I've noted here is by David Williamson, uh, another big name in Australian drama. He's known mostly as a stage dramatist, but uh, he's written the screenplay for this film. And so this is about two Australian sprinters who face the brutal realities of war when they're sent to fight in the Gallipoli campaign in Turkey during World War I. So this film starts as an archetypal sports movie but ends with the most horrifyingly high impact finale of any Australian film. But it's ultimately a film that's about innocence and coming of age not simply for the characters, but for Australia as a whole, because Gallipoli historically is that moment when Australia sees itself as having gained maturity. It reinforces the myth of the Aussie larrikin at the mercy of the incompetent English. And so where can you go to get help? Well, you know, who would have thought the internet is helpful? You'll see here a screenshot from where I got a line in this presentation. What starts as an archetypal sports movie ends with the most horrifyingly high impact finale. That's straight off the internet. I stole that, I admit it. Okay, so use the internet, get some information. It's important to have a clear focus when you're viewing a film because there's a million things you could look at. So I'm going to be keeping my focus on perspectives because it's an important part of this unit. So in doing that, I'm going to focus on Australia's landscape and the characters as representative of Australian ideas and the subject matter of Gallipoli and its meaning to Australians. These perspectives about our landscape, about our people and about this event are really important to understanding the film. Now the opening scene is really important. When you first watch it, it just seems like a, uh, any other scene, but you'll see that it comes back at the very end in an important way. But one of the key parts is that the bush is a, uh, a, an important piece of imagery in this film. Archie, the main character himself, is identified as a young Australia. He's not simply just a character in his own right. He represents Australia as a whole. And the structure of this scene will be very important to the end. It becomes a callback at the very ending, and I'll explain that later in this video. Deeper. Come on, deeper, deeper. Come on, deeper. Come on, deeper, deeper. Here, boy, here. That's it. Now, loosen up. Come on, loosen up. Come on, boy, loosen them up. That's it. Now on the spot. One, two, one, two, one, two. What are your legs? Springs. Steel springs. What are they going to do? Hurl me down the track. How fast can you run? As fast as a leopard. How fast are you going to run? As fast as a leopard. Then let's see you do it. Are you ready, Leopard? On your mark. Get set. <sighs> Come on, boy. Come on, boy. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> 
And so Archie and Frank are both sprinters. We've already talked about that. But the characters themselves are contrasts to each other. Archie represents this idea of loyalty. He's a Bush character. He's a patriotic Australian. Whereas Frank, he represents the city and this pragmatic view. In this scene, we see, uh, we see him talking about how uh, this war is an English war and it's not for Australians. But this uh, journey that we see here is symbolic in itself. This journey from the bush to the city, but it's also a journey where the two characters come to form this really unique bond. And when you watch this scene, I want you to pay attention to the composition. And when we talk about composition, we're talking about the arrangement of all the objects and everything in the shot. And you'll see in the last part of this scene that there's absolute silence, that there's a big story being told simply through the composition and through the movements of the characters. We see their friendship really uh, being formed here in the desert through the camera work. You of all people should be going. Why me of all people? Because you're an athlete. <laughs> What's that got to do with it? I've got mates who'd be lucky to run the 100 in 12 and they're going to do their bit. So why shouldn't you? Because it's not our bloody war. What do you mean not our war? <laughs> it's an English war. It's got nothing to do with it. You know what you are? You're a bloody coward. There's only one reason why I haven't knocked you down, mate. What? Because I don't feel like carrying you to the next bloody water hole. Now shut up and don't open your yap about the war again. The city bush juxtaposition that I referred to earlier is revealed with the humiliation of Frank or the humiliation of the city boy in this particular scene. What we see is this romanticized image of the bush through Archie, but there's also this sense of inevitability about the city. Keep in mind that this film was first seen in 1981 and you're watching it after that. Australia is incredibly urbanized, but we have this romantic idea about the bush and the bush character. In fact, these characters kind of hark back to Henry Lawson, Banjo Patterson sort of poetry with the, the Aussie Bushman as being this archetypal hero, that Ned Kelly type of hero. But these differences, this juxtaposition is going to be resolved through the war itself through the battle in Gallipoli where the city bush no longer matters and this unified idea of Australia is formed. Done. Sir, any previous military experience done? Yes, sir, five years in the Melbourne Horse Cadets. Never heard of them. Well, no, sir, they never received as much recognition as they deserved. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Sales, you're in. Report to that group over there. Done. Mount up. Foot in the stirrup. Knee in his shoulder and relax. Thanks, mate. Stirrup. Knee in the shoulder. Thank you. Come on, pal. I'm your uncle Frank. Tough but fair, so no bloody nonsense, eh? <laughs> Hurry up, done, or the war will be over. Thank you very much. 
Now here is where film and fact collide in this next scene that you're going to have a look at. One of the key parts of this is that we have this comment that the British were sipping tea on Suvla Bay, all the while the Australians are about to go over the top in order to provide a cover or a distraction to uh, keep the Turkish forces away from Suvla Bay. Now this is historically inaccurate in so many ways, but that's not the point. This film was made in 1981. This scene is all about context. The context of Australian nationalism. By 1981, Australia has this really confident sense of self. Before then, like even before the Vietnam War, Australia was incredibly loyal to the British, despite what our own kind of, uh, I guess, folk history kind of tells us. That in the 1980s, Australian cinema becomes confident and Australian culture becomes confident. And this scene is where we've constructed this idea of the British as being callous and cold. Um, and we see that happen here. Around the same time, there's a mini series that comes out on TV called Bodyline, which is all about Don Bradman and the Bodyline series, again, demonizing the English. Historically inaccurate in this case in Gallipoli, but it is, like I said before, this is all about context. This is all about appealing to the audience to raise the drama in the next scene. It does sound pointless to go on. On the other hand... Excuse me, sir, British are ashore at Suvla. Are they meeting heavy opposition? None, sir. Apparently they've called a halt and the officers are sitting on the beach drinking cups of tea. Tell Major Barton the attack is... No, just tell him that I'm reconsidering the whole situation. In this next scene, you, uh, we're reaching the climax of the whole film, and it's a callback to the opening scene. I'll talk about that um, after we watch the, uh, watch the scene. What I'd like you to focus on while you're watching this is the cross-cutting. Now, cross-cutting is, is an editing technique where you have two different kinds of shots, two different things happening in different places that are connected. So here, you're going to have Frank running frantically back to the trenches to call off the, call off the charge, ultimately to save his friend Archie. And that's cut against Archie and all the other soldiers preparing for, uh, to go over the top. I've selected this scene to begin at the moment where the officer in charge is calling it outright murder, what's about to happen. So you can see here the raising of the emotions for the audience. In the final shot, we see this futility of war. We have um, Mark Lee or we have Archie here in this final shot looking like a Christ figure with his arms outstretched as he's been killed. Be careful with that though. I've seen a lot of students, as soon as they see a character with their arms outstretched, say, oh, that's just like a Christ figure. It only works as that kind of imagery if you have a sense of sacrifice going with the image. So in this, we have Archie being sacrificed here with his arms outstretched. There's another meaning to this uh, a shot that I'll talk about after you've watched the scene. And that goes to the call back to the opening shot. But have a look at this scene for the use of music and that use of cross-cutting to raise the drama and to uh, bring this final scene to its climax. Not by me, sir. I've asked for confirmation from General Gard. Orders are to attack and you'll do so immediately. The British at Suvla must be allowed to get ashore. Is that clear? You are to push on. It's cold-blooded murder. I said push on. Men to do, I wouldn't do myself. All right, men. We're going. I want you all to remember who you are. With a tenth light horse. Men from Western Australia. Don't forget it. Good luck. Good luck, sir.
between your legs. Springs. Single springs. What are you gonna do? You gonna hurl me down the track? How fast can you run? Fast as a leopard. How fast are you gonna run? As fast as a leopard. Then let's see you do it. So this callback is yeah, it's a structural technique that brings the conclusion of the film back to its beginning. So on the right here, I've got a couple of shots. At the top, we have the, at the end of that opening scene where he's just run in training for the race and he's crossed the line and he's got his arms outstretched. And we see that very similar shot in the very ending. So while before you watch the scene, I was talking about that shot as having that kind of Christ-like sacrificial image, it also works as the callback to the opening, him crossing a finish line. So just as he's getting shot, he's got his chest out as if he's crossing a finish, finishing line. And, if, and then we see that his finishing line is his own life. And so what you can see there is that the one shot can have two meanings going on. And that's perfectly all right. They're not in conflict with each other. When we talk about shades of meaning and layers of meaning, that's what we're on about. This last shot works on so many levels. In fact, the final minute of the film is almost a complete recreation of the first minute of the film with that self-talk about what are your legs, their springs, and, and what he's going to do in that running. We also have the exact same whistle that signals the start of the race in the opening shot and the start of the charge over the top in, in the end. And we also have, after the hail of gunfire, we have silence with just Archie alone out in the middle uh, running his race before he gets shot. It's an incredibly dramatic technique and then it fades to black. And so you can imagine an audience, particularly 1981, at this time when they're feeling very patriotic about being Australian and that's the last thing they see in the film. Very, very poignant ending to the film. So in this video, I've discussed symbolism, I've discussed shot composition, I've discussed film structure and representation. Those have been the key points here that I've covered here. I've also discussed the perspectives about Gallipoli offered through this film as a representation of an event and of Australian people and their values. But I've also, and more importantly, shown that by only looking at a few key scenes, the overall meaning of the text can be discussed in a lot of detail. You don't have to pick the, pick the eyes out of every single scene in a film. You just select the ones that are all about your focus. And so my focus was on the perspectives about landscape and the people, and, I, and I've only looked at the scenes that were relevant to that. So hopefully this has helped you out, and hopefully this can give you some ideas for your own interpretation of the film you study. Good luck.